To me, some of the most hilariously intriguing controversies in online discourse are those involving bootlegs. Yes, we've all seen these viral stories showing knockoff products, copycat Chinese companies, and blatantly obvious instances of intellectual property theft. Some cases so egregious that it's downright comical. From fake Jordans with phallic appendages to offensive Asian KFC ripoffs replacing the Colonel with Barack Obama to video games illegally using Disney characters to simulate C-section surgery. The imagination of bootleggers is seemingly limitless, and today I'll be taking you on a tour through some of the brands, knockoff products, and companies that have been wrapped up in bootlegging controversies. Some of these stories ending in costly civil lawsuits. These are the internet's most bizarre bootlegs. Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, and to begin the ad, let me show you my hair from some old videos back in 2020. Yeah, your boy was losing hair and losing it fast. I didn't want to go bald, so I decided to do something about my hair loss and got started with Keeps, and the results have been pretty insane. Here's me at six months after starting Keeps, a year after starting, almost two years after starting, and here's me now, three and a half years after starting Keeps, and your boy's looking pretty good. Keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA approved hair loss products at a can't be price, and best of all, you skip the trip to the doctor's office and pharmacy. Keeps will set you up with a prescriber online and ship your prescription right to your front door, and in four to six months, you should start seeing results. Look, I've been using Keeps for most of my YouTube career at this point, it works, and if you're a guy that's having some anxiety about hair loss, there's no better time than now to start Keeps. To get started, you guys can go to keeps.com slash wavy and use code wavy to take advantage of their special offer. Big thanks to Keeps for sponsoring. So how about a story involving a very recent case of bootlegging? The Mexican Bucky's incident. Bucky's is a staple of Texas, and it's successfully spreading to other regions of the United States for good reason. We're talking locations with over 200 fuel pumps, a sprawling market filled wall to wall with signature snacks, beverage, and Bucky the Beaver merchandise, a hot bar constantly serving fresh brisket sandwiches, baked goods, and tacos. Now, aside from all the amenities that they provide, Bucky's has also become successful in part due to the popularity of their logo or mascot, Bucky the Beaver. Their their beaver mascot is found on practically every product sold in the store, and I'd be willing to bet you've seen some folks in your town wearing shirts or hats featuring this beaver. And with a business and intellectual property as hot as Bucky's, it's no surprise that some out there have attempted to illegally make use of some of Bucky's trademarks. Which brings us to the bizarre case of the Mexican Bucky's. On July 23rd of 2023, a photo was uploaded to Facebook by a man named Ramon Montalongo. The caption, which has been translated from Spanish to English, reads, You are not going to believe this. Apparently photographed just out of the city of Montemoros, Mexico, Ramon's photo appeared to have exposed a previously undetected Bucky's bootlegging operation. His image showcased a store that was under construction, this ramshackle concrete building featuring some rather curious signage and logo work. The joint was called Buck E's, the E's spelled with two I's instead of E-E-S. And its exterior walls also featured imagery of a grotesque looking buck tooth rat creature. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, look at this family dollar ass buckies we got here. So as you can clearly see, the intent with this Mexican buck ease was to jack the swag of the Texas based company. Ramon's photo showcasing this apparent bootleg operation would subsequently go viral on Facebook. The comment section of his post flooded with a seemingly endless stream of laughing emojis. However, when news of this bootleg buckies made it back to buckies in Texas, well, the company wasn't taking this as any kind of joke, and as a matter of fact, they were pretty pissed off about it. Several days after being made aware of the Mexican Buckies, they put out this statement. The Buckies brand represents clean restrooms, freshly prepared food, and great service. Buckies has invested heavily in innovation across the company to create and maintain these award-winning guest experiences. Accordingly, Buckies will not stand as an idle spectator while others use without permission the intellectual property that Buckies has cultivated for decades. And after this statement, there were rumors floating around that Bucky's was going after Bucky's legally. 
It's important to note that Bucky's has somewhat of a track record of going after companies legally for copyright and trademark infringement and have actually been pretty successful in these regards. For example, in 2018, Bucky's won a federal trademark lawsuit against a Texas barbecue restaurant chain called Choke Canyon Barbecue. The basis of this suit being that Choke Canyon had violated their trademark by using this logo and mascot. A hat-wearing alligator flashing a smile in front of a yellow background looking up and to the left. Putting Choke Canyon next to Bucky's, you can kind of see where the company was coming from here. And with both joints being known for their barbecue brisket, I can understand why Bucky's had some qualms with this. In the time since Bucky's has made their comment on the Mexican bootleg, it appears the fake Bucky's store has completely redesigned their mascot in front signage, in what seems to be an effort to placate the company and possibly avoid future litigation. As you can see, the mascot has lost the red cap and has gone through a complete makeover. Looks like he grew a little bit of a mullet too. Which is fucking hilarious to me though, because now with this redesign done, it almost appears like they're kind of stealing the generic chipmunk design that you see in Disney animations, but I digress. As of now, I can't find any evidence of a lawsuit being filed against the company, but considering this is a recent story, I wouldn't be surprised if an update comes forward. And here we are, KFC. KFC is a fast food staple and the Colonel's Chicken has become famous around the world. Internationally, KFC is particularly popular in Asian countries. And because of this, many Asian merchants and entrepreneurs want to get franchising rights to sell the food. However, it can be quite difficult for international sellers to get these rights. And in some cases, when individuals can't legally take advantage of the Colonel's branding, they get a little creative. And that's what brings us to the story of Obama Fried Chicken, or OFC. In October of 2011, images began to surface on social media showing what appeared to be a KFC restaurant in Beijing, China. However, instead of the face of Colonel Sanders being in the logo, it was the visage of then-President Barack Obama, smiling from ear to ear. The slogan at the bottom of the sign can be translated as saying, we're so cool, aren't we? The restaurant was called OFC, AKA Obama Fried Chicken. So not only was this restaurant infringing on KFC's IP with them basically stealing the brand theming, um, the inclusion of Barack Obama here in the context of it being a fried chicken restaurant is extremely questionable to say the least. The owner of this restaurant would be identified as 21-year-old Chinese man Zhu Bali. Initially, his motives for including Obama in his branding were unclear, but many made their own assumptions. Naturally, the logo sparked quite the outrage in the West, and KFC wasn't all too happy about the kernel swapping either. When the story hit the US media, Reverend and civil rights activist Al Sharpton denounced the Obama fried chicken restaurant and said it was, quote, insulting, offensive, and plays to racial stereotypes. A KFC China spokesman echoed this sentiment and stated they were extremely displeased with the uses of their trademark and were considering suing OFC. Quote, we're considering legal action as it's a knockoff and has nothing to do with us and infringes on our brand trademark. We find it distasteful. However, speaking on this matter, in a way backfired for KFC because they were almost immediately met with critics that reminded them that KFC, you guys literally commissioned a Chinese KFC commercial earlier in that same year that had an Obama lookalike in it. Change, not only for America, but for the whole world. Not only for your mom, but for you, for your stomach, for a better taste. Change is good. In fairness to KFC, they would later apologize for this commercial, stating, quote, it was meant to be a spoof and no disrespect was intended. And I really don't think they meant any harm by this. The commercial was more so about Obama's change slogan. You know, they're going from, they're changing from KFC chicken sandwiches to, hey, we also have fish sandwiches too. Whatever the case, there were some folks that were upset about that commercial. But anyways, back to OFC. Even the Chinese locals were upset about Obama fried chicken, as apparently Zhu's Obama chicken 
chicken was actually quite delicious and popular with customers. And thanks in part to the recognizability of Zoo's KFC-styled branding, his shop was outselling and outcompeting nearby street food merchants. During the swirling controversy, it seemed like everyone in the world had weighed in on it, except for Zoo himself. In October of 2011, a news crew would manage to catch up with Zoo outside of his OFC restaurant and finally asked him why he used Obama as the mascot for his fried chicken joint. The answer might not be what you expected. In this interview, Zhu would explain that he had somewhat of an Obama obsession and deeply admired the US president for what he describes as having a positive attitude and cheerful smile. He claims that he had no intention of being offensive or violating KFC's trademark or invoking any racial stereotypes. Keep in mind this story took place back in 2011, which was during Obama's first term, and this was probably the peak of the man's international popularity. He was famous all over the world. The man was loved by many internationally due to his charismatic persona. In fact, some folks would actually capitalize off of the love for Obama, often making fake bootleg Obama merchandise and using him in logos for their own trade benefits. So it's possible that Zoo got caught up in this frenzy, but maybe was ignorant of the sort of uh, Western stereotype that he maybe inadvertently engaged in here. It's really tough to say, but I'm almost willing to give this guy the benefit of the doubt because he seems like more of an Obama fan than anything. In an apparent effort to placate KFC and their legal threats, Zoo would eventually change the name of OFC to UFO, and after some pressure from local authorities, he would reluctantly remove the infamous Obama fried chicken sign. Despite the massive world wide discourse that followed this controversy, you might be surprised to find that Zoo was never legally pursued by KFC in any serious capacity. And as far as we know, he continues to operate restaurants to this day. And that was the story of Obama fried chicken. In this video, we previously discussed the Obama fried chicken incident, a case where a Chinese man used the face of a world leader to sell chicken. And while that's indeed quite bizarre, what if I told you there was a case of a chicken salesman who rebranded his restaurant featuring logo and iconography of one of the most infamous world leaders ever? Yes, this is the story of Hitler fried chicken. In 2013, a man from London was on vacation in Bangkok, Thailand when he came across a curious fast food restaurant. He took a photo of the place and published his findings to the internet, where the photo would then be shared to Twitter by a man named Andrew Spooner. Spooner's tweet quotes the Londoner who discovered it, quote, very bizarre fried chicken shop in Thailand. I kid you not, complete with a picture of Hitler in a bow tie. Taking a look at the image, we see that the fast food joint had apparently swapped the face of Colonel Sanders with that of the genocidal Fuhrer and was using Hitler to further its chicken selling goals. And what you might find surprising is that this restaurant was said to have been somewhat popular with locals getting rave reviews. Hitler Chicken had opened in June of 2013 and on its menu were fried chicken, burgers, and kebabs. A Western traveler who visited the spot said, quote, I went in for a bite last week and got some fried chicken, which was pretty good. I asked the guy behind the counter why it was called Hitler. He just shrugged his shoulders and said the owners had thought it was a good image. I couldn't think of a fucking better image to represent my chicken restaurant, you know guys? Seriously. So naturally this post would go somewhat viral online for just the fucking batshit juxtaposition that we got going on here. Hitler chicken would leave the online world scratching their heads. Why would anybody use Hitler as their mascot? And not only that, why was it working? Well, to better make sense of this bizarre marketing ploy, allow me to introduce you to what has been dubbed as Nazi chic. Nazi chic has been described as the use of style, imagery, and paraphernalia in clothing or pop culture related to Nazi Germany. Throughout the 2010s, Nazi chic had become somewhat of a fad within Southeast Asia, Thailand in particular. It was quite popular with the youth who were the ones who were the most ignorant of Hitler's deeds and symbolism. In fact, it's said that at the time that it wasn't all too uncommon to find school children dressing up as Nazis, and bootleggers were selling Nazi-themed t-shirts and artwork around the country because people wanted this type of apparel. And while it's impossible to say why this symbolism was so popular in Southeast Asia at the time, I'll just go back to what I said earlier. I think you had a lot of young people who were just completely ignorant about what Hitler did. 
I think the Holocaust is something we know way more about as Westerners, and maybe, you know, it's not really talked about that much in Asia. To exemplify the popularity of Nazi chic at the time, there was once a case in 2016 involving a Taiwanese high school orchestrating a Christmas parade, wherein the students dressed up and marched in Nazi-themed uniforms, performing Zig Heils and constructing a cardboard tank to boot. And apparently, the theme of this parade was voted on by the students themselves. This parade would go viral online and drew international criticism, resulting in the school administrators being humiliated and later apologizing for the parade. Quote, when reviewing the parade beforehand, we failed to closely consider the meaning of the historical facts. I mean, seriously, it's like they're treating the garb as like a fucking Halloween costume, you know? And with this context explained, let's return back to Hitler fried chicken. When this image went viral in the West, many were confused, but a lot more were outraged by it, understandably so. And considering the fact that Hitler's face was swapped with Colonel Sanders and they were using the KFC theming, it was only a matter of time before the KFC people came after this Hitler chicken place. After discovering the viral Hitler fried chicken image, the company would make a statement regarding the shop. We find it extremely distasteful and are considering legal action since it's an infringement of our brand trademark and has nothing to do with us. These threats appeared to successfully have spooked the owners, as after KFC spoke up, Hitler fried chicken changed its name to Hler and allegedly took the sign down featuring the KFC style branding. There's not much else to report about this story, and it's said that Southeast Asia's fascination with Hitler still remains to this day, at least in a smaller proportion. In the world of fictional restaurants, the Krusty Krab might just be the most iconic. Owned and operated by Eugene Krabs of Bikini Bottom, this penny-pinching crustacean has made a great fortune over the years off the backs of SpongeBob and Squidward. Krabs' arch nemesis is rival fast food restaurant owner Sheldon J. Plankton, who restlessly attempts to steal Mr. Krabs' Krabby Patty's secret formula. You might say that Plankton is an intellectual property thief of sorts, but as we all know, Plankton has yet to be successful at stealing Mr. Krabs' formula. But what if I told you that a Texas-based restaurant was. The story begins in 2021 when a company called Pixie Universal opened a SpongeBob-themed pop-up restaurant in Houston, Texas. Funded by a businessman named Sam Chand, this restaurant was called the Rusty Crab. And these guys really pulled out all the stops when it comes to looking like the real Krusty Crab. The Rusty Crab sold SpongeBob-themed food items and drinks, Krabby Patties included. And the restaurant's interior featured an admittedly impressive real-life adaptation of Mr. Krabs' diner. However, while the theming was well executed, the food and drink quality wasn't getting the ravest of reviews. Customers complained about having to pay for a ticket to get in. The food and drink prices were high as well, and an excessive amount of mandatory gratuity was added to each bill. Which this is hilarious to me because all the stuff I just mentioned sounds like some shit that Mr. Krabs would pull in the Krusty Krab. Money! Now keep in mind, this restaurant was in no way licensed by Nickelodeon or Spongebob. And uh, that begs the question, is this legal? At the time, Mr. Chand claimed that the Rusty Crab was an artistic interpretation of the fictional restaurant and had no affiliation with the actual brand. The website said, quote, we are not affiliated, authorized, endorsed by, or in any way officially connected with Nickelodeon or the SpongeBob brand directly, or any of its subsidiaries or its affiliates. This is Kefi HTX's artistic adaptation recreation of an amazing series that added value to our childhood. So yeah, they were very much forthcoming that they had nothing to do with SpongeBob. It's not like they were trying to hide from it. And it's almost as if they seem like they would be protected legally by some sort of parody exemption under IP trademark law. In this news interview, a woman named Asha, who was apparently affiliated with ownership, candidly spoke about the show and how it was her dream to open a Krusty Krab style diner one day. Hey, good morning to you, Jose. So, uh, like a lot of folks, I'm a huge SpongeBob fan, so I was very excited about this. We've got Asha, she is the owner, and you helped bring the Rusty Crab to life. Talk about this experience. Yes, well, I've been a SpongeBob fan literally since I was about 10 years old, so this is a lifelong dream of mine to be able to recreate something that was so nostalgic in my childhood. I really wanted to give it a feel of people actually being in Bikini Bottom, and I believe we nailed it, don't you think? You guys absolutely nailed it. 
Despite the complaints from prices, the Rusty Crab would be somewhat of a popular attraction in Houston, but its virality online would be an issue as eventually it found its way back to Viacom CBS, the at the time owners of SpongeBob. On May 25th of 2021, Viacom sent a cease and desist letter to the Rusty Crab. However, after receiving this letter, the very next day, the Rusty Crab announced that it was extending its run through August 1st and that tickets would be available to enter until the end of 2021. Taking this as a signal that the Rusty Crab wasn't going to cease or desist, Viacom decided they were just going to sue him. In their lawsuit, Viacom comments that the restaurant featured illustrations and designs that were exact copies of those featured in their SpongeBob SquarePants cartoon. In addition to this, they cite workers dressed up just like the characters from the show. As a defense, the owners at Pixie Universal would state that the Rusty Crab was made as parody and that their imitation of the restaurant should be allowed under parody exemptions and copyright law. However, unfortunately for the Rusty Crab, a judge would disagree, as it was later determined that the Rusty Crab had violated Viacom's intellectual property rights. As a result of this lawsuit, the company behind the creation of the Rusty Crab was ordered by the courts to pay six million dollars in copyright damages to Paramount, who had recently acquired Viacom, as well as the transfer of all Rusty Crab online domain names to Paramount as well. I gotta say I'm honestly kind of conflicted on this one because of the videos that I've seen of the inside of the Rusty Crab, they did a damn good job of imitating the cartoon version of the restaurant. So I guess the next thing I'd like to ask is like Paramount, can you guys make your own Krusty Krab at Universal or whatever fucking park uh, Nickelodeon is associated with? That would be pretty sick. But that was the story of the Rusty Krab. In this next story, we'll be looking at a bootleg adjacent internet mystery that began all the way back in 2001. That mystery only being solved as recently as 2021. This is the strange case of the curiously named business, Microsoft Benbows. This internet mystery all begins on July 20th of 2001 on Alf's Room, a Japanese blog managed by a man in his 50s named Yoshinori Adachi. On this day, Adachi would post a blog entry titled Microsoft Benbows. It contained an image of what appeared to be an electronic store of the same name. And on the surface, this looked like the store owner was attempting to create like a bootleg version of a Microsoft store. Adachi took and uploaded the photo himself, simply finding the obvious Microsoft inspired theming of the business to be humorous. While at face value, the name Microsoft Benbo seems like nothing more than an amalgamation of random vowels and consonant sounds, there's actually more than what meets the eye here. The word Microsoft being used as the Japanese pronunciation of Microsoft can sometimes sound like this when spoken natively. And the word bimbo is a Japanese word that can be roughly translated in English to mean cheap. So add these two together, you get Microsoft Benbos, a store that sells cheap electronic slash computer parts. I guess. The Microsoft Benbo's post on Adachi's Alf's Room blog wouldn't see much attention initially and would soon be forgotten as few visited this page. But his photo would live on. Several years later, the Microsoft Benbo's image found its way onto Western internet forums and the image became a popular meme on subreddits like r slash crappy off brands, with many pointing to the business as a cliche Asian bootleg company. However, at this point, the attribution to Adachi had been lost and nobody really knew the source of this image. This was problematic because many were wondering where this business was located and what it did as some wanted to actually go there and check it out. As Microsoft Benbos grew as a meme, its popularity expanded to a small legion of internet detectives who would then task themselves with cracking the Microsoft Benbos mystery. One such individual was YouTuber Nick Robinson, who in 2021 managed to re discover Adachi's long lost Alf's Room post that was published nearly 20 years prior regarding Microsoft Benbos. Nick would then arduously scry over Adachi's blog post and report his findings to his large viewer base. In a subsequent video, he would communicate these findings, reading several comments found in the old blog in his report. One old comment to the blog revealed that Microsoft Benbos had actually closed down since Adachi authored his post in 2001. 
Ten. Here are some of the messages authored by Adachi and an anonymous user on the old blog. Used PC and parts shop Microsoft Benbos. It's a suspicious name. It's a parody of Microsoft Windows. It's a used PC and parts shop, isn't it? In other words, it's a hardware store, right? That's true, but the name is Microsoft. Is that okay with such a name? The logo mark is just the reverse of the Windows one. I think Microsoft will complain. It wouldn't be strange to come, though it appears the store closed around the end of 2002. Nick found that Adachi's blog post also featured the location of where the man took the famous Microsoft Benbo's photo. This picture was apparently taken by Adachi in Maibashi City in Kogimachi, Japan. Nick's visit to this long-lost ancient blog post answered a lot of questions regarding the Microsoft Benbo's mystery that had sprung up in the early 2010s. However, the biggest question was where exactly was the Microsoft Benbo's building? Yes, according to Adachi, it had been closed down, but people still wanted to know where this place was. Not one to leave stones unturned, Nick refused to yield on his quest to fully solve the Microsoft Benbo's puzzle. And with unwavering dedication to the cause, he then tasked himself to scan the entirety of Meibashi City using Google VR, in the hopes of basically brute forcing his way into finding the old Microsoft Benbo's building, you know, basically looking around and seeing if he could find a structure that matched the image. One might say this would be like finding a needle in a haystack. However, after countless hours of what likely at the time felt like a hopeless endeavor, Nick Robinson stumbles upon a miracle. The madman actually fucking found the building. Through brute force and a bit of luck, Nick was able to locate the building, which was formerly Microsoft Benbo's. He would publish the address to the internet, and all things considered, that was the end of a 20-year-long internet mystery. Microsoft Benbo's had been solved. Nick's video was met with much fanfare online. As coming from someone who has solved some internet mysteries myself, it's a good feeling and deserves praise whenever someone cracks an old one like this. So shout out to Nick. The cherry on top of this story is that Nick would actually travel in real life to the location of the Microsoft Benbo's some time after finding it virtually. The Microsoft Benbo's computer hardware store had since been converted into a restaurant, which Nick would eat and drink at. A rather satisfying conclusion to one of the biggest mysteries in internet bootleg history. I'd imagine that few of you are surprised to find Disney in a video about bootlegging. As the owner of some of the most valuable intellectual property in the world, Disney is constantly subjected to bootlegging efforts. Generally, this takes the form of unauthorized retailers selling counterfeit merchandise. And while this is certainly the most damaging form of theft, I honestly think the more intriguing cases of Disney bootlegging have come from people trying to make fake movies and video games using their characters. Take for example the case of the Autobots, which is considered to be by some the most egregious and shameless case of Chinese bootlegging ever. Autobots was a movie produced by a Chinese production studio called Blue MTV Movie Studio in 2015. So this is Autobots, obviously the name is just straight up jacking the Transformers, but the name really only scratches the surface of the IP thievery we've got going on here. Let's take a closer look at the poster. Taking a look at the movie's poster, you notice another problem. Yeah, this is just straight up cars, and that's like scuffed Lightning McQueen right there. Getting into the film itself, we find that Autobot's plot revolves around an engineer whose experiments result in anthropomorphic vehicles, each with various conflicting personality traits. The vehicles having to work together despite their differences to win difficult races. Autobot's protagonist and shameless Lightning McQueen knockoff is a character dubbed K-1. The scene from the movie that I'm about to show you simultaneously introduces the character and showcases the dog shit quality of this movie. Oh, 
要去教训他们。So yeah, there's really no reason for me to like point by point break down this movie. This is a Cars knockoff. It's the bootleg to end all bootlegs, seriously. And people were quick to catch on to this. After Autobot's release in China, clips and posters related to the movie would find their way to the screens of Western internet users, and it wouldn't be long before Disney sniffed out the bootleg. Keep in mind, this was a movie actually showing in Chinese theaters. After discovering what they saw as blatant IP theft, Disney would file a lawsuit against the Blue MTV movie studio in China, taking them to court late in 2016. Disney would later win a settlement of $195,000 due to the Autobots theft. And yes, as you can see in the case of the Autobots, Disney's characters are often used to create bootleg animations and movies. But there have been a small example of cases where Disney characters are used to make unauthorized video games, sometimes to disturbing effect. One particular incident of this occurred in early 2015 when a mobile game app appeared on app stores wherein you played as an OBGYN and using surgical tools and witchcraft performed a C-section on Anna from Frozen, the entire game relying heavily on characters taken from the Disney Frozen universe. The game begins with the player checking the baby's heartbeat using a fetal heart monitor. Then users are instructed to pick up a scalpel and perform a C-section on the Disney character. Many on YouTube would play this app because it was so shocking and they would get views and as a result of this it got exposure and some outrage followed. Many would chime in on social media complaining about the graphic game, fearing that kids would accidentally play it and become traumatized. Please do not download or play Anna Gives Birth. It will ruin Frozen and scar you for life. In light of the discovery of this unauthorized game, the Frozen C-Section simulator has since been pulled from app stores. And as far as I'm aware, no legal suit ever came out of this situation. In recent years, Bluey has established itself as the top dog when it comes to children's entertainment programming. This widely beloved kids show has won numerous awards since first airing in 2018 and is consumed by families around the world with parents praising Bluey for the show teaching children important life lessons. Any of you guys out there with kids know just how popular Bluey is and I know there are some adults out there that watch the show as well. Hopefully that doesn't turn into another brony situation, but I digress. Unfortunately though, with any children's IP that becomes popular, there are going to be some bad actors out there that try to profit off of children. And sometimes this leads to kids getting traumatized. Those of you who have been on YouTube for some time are most likely familiar with Elsa Gate. Elsagate was, and to some extent still is, an ongoing YouTube crisis involving dubious content creators stealing popular children's IP and using it to create explicit cartoons and bootleg animations featuring these characters for financial gain. This disturbing content insidiously finds its way into the YouTube algorithm of children, and kids have been inadvertently traumatized by this deceptive content on many occasions. Sadly, because of Bluey's popularity in recent years, it has become the target of these bootleggers. Bluey is now commonly used to make Elsagate style animations, with thousands of these videos bubbling up on YouTube in the past couple of years. Some of these Bluey Elsagate videos feature outright violence, while others include scat fetishes or simply encourage children to misbehave. Many parents have caught their children watching these videos and have gone public on social media to express their concerns. Quote, has anyone seen this? My husband put it on for our daughter and it's not Bluey. Honestly, I just turned it off ASAP, so I don't know what happens, but Bluey and Bingo were crying in the first scene. It's ridiculous what they do to kids shows. All of these shows are turned into inappropriate, poorly animated videos. It's disgusting. 
I won't let my kids watch this version. It's odd and weird things happen. My three-year-old screamed and shut it off one day because the parents were hitting Bluey and Bingo, and it freaked them out. That was the day YouTube got removed from the TV. With outcry from parents and the media, this Bluey bootlegging has been quelled to some extent by YouTube, with Bluey bootlegs regularly being taken down after reports. But as we saw with the original Elsa Gay trend in 2018, it seems impossible to fully stop the producers of this content, though I'd imagine it's only a matter of time before the show's producer, the BBC, steps in and protects its IP legally. That being said though, there is one front of the Bluey IP battle that BBC has already launched an attack on, that being the rampant production of bootleg Bluey merchandise. Around the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, online retailers like Amazon Wish, Alibaba, and eBay became flooded with bootleg Bluey merchandise. This illegal merchandise was becoming so popular that it started cutting into the profits of the official BBC stuff. And as a result of this, in March of 2023, the BBC initiated a blanket lawsuit targeting a number of online sellers. The case was filed on June 20th of 2023 in Chicago, Illinois. BBC Studios Distribution has demanded that the courts prevent the defendants from using Bluey trademarks, which has been used on everything from t-shirts to electronic toothbrushes. The company has also asked Amazon, Walmart, Alibaba, eBay, AliExpress, Wish, Etsy, and DHgate to halt selling any imitation Bluey products. The lawsuit is still ongoing, but I'd imagine there'll probably be more to come, as Bluey remains the top dog in the bootleggers are still going forward on all cylinders. When you think of bootlegs, one of the first things that comes to mind is probably Michael Jordan's shoes, or Jordans. I would be remiss if I didn't discuss Jordan in a video about bootlegs. Initially launched in collaboration with Michael Jordan and Nike in April of 1985, Air Jordan shoes would go on to become a worldwide phenomena and have evolved over the years to become one of the world's most iconic and lucrative brands. Even more iconic than the name Air Jordan is the upholstered logo found on almost every pair of Jordans, the Jumpman. The logo, which was inspired by a real-life photo taken of Michael Jordan, has accrued legendary status in terms of brand identity. You could even say that it metaphorically occupies a throne at the pantheon of god-tier American brands, with shit like McDonald's and Coca-Cola at its flanks. It goes without saying Air Jordans are highly coveted by consumers, and they aren't cheap to buy, often listed at MSRP prices in the hundreds of dollars. And due to their high price and coveted nature, it's no surprise that bootlegs have plagued the brand almost since the day of its inception. Hey! This motherfucker got them fake keys! <laughs> I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Bootleg Jordans can be rather convincing at times, and sometimes not so much. Convincing ones certainly do undermine the brand. Even wealthy celebrities get tricked into purchasing bogus Jordans. In fact, rapper Kendrick Lamar went viral somewhat recently after he was shown wearing fake Jordans in a photo posted to his private Instagram account. Other famous viral bootlegging incidents have been far less convincing, such as this notorious pair of bootlegged Jordans that appeared on Reddit. The shoes featuring a Jumpman logo, albeit with a curious additional appendage. And there are a litany of other examples of terribly executed fake Jordans. With fake Jordans being an almost perpetual plague on the company, it's no surprise that there have been some pretty hefty lawsuits filed, particularly ones involving China. In August of 2007, Nike won two lawsuits against two Chinese shoemakers as well as a French supermarket chain that had been allegedly copying the prized Air Jordan logo and selling it on shoes. Nike employees had found shoes being sold for $13 a pair in outlets operated at these facilities. Nike was seeking $131,000 in damages as a result of this incident. While this lawsuit against Chinese bootleggers was an easy win, subsequent ones would prove quite difficult. Several years later, Later, Michael Jordan himself would issue a lawsuit against a Chinese footwear company that he was accusing of stealing the Air Jordan's intellectual property. The company was called Chiaodin Sports. Chiaodin is literally a Chinese pronunciation of the name Jordan, and the company also had their own variation of the Jordan Jumpman logo. Michael Jordan saw this as them misappropriating his name for a quick buck. In comments regarding the case, Michael would comment that it was not about the money, but the principle and protecting his identity. It's not about the money, it's about principle. Um, protecting my identity 
in my name. I have no other choice but to turn to the courts. I feel the need to protect my name, my identity, and the Chinese consumers. Unfortunately for him, though, the case was rejected in the lower courts in Beijing in 2012. Undeterred by this initial ruling, Michael Jordan brought the case to the Beijing Higher People's Court, but again, the courts ruled against the basketball star in 2015. Their reasoning being, yes, Chow Dian is definitely named Jordan and selling shoes with logos similar to yours, but... They could just be referring to any guy in the world named Jordan. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're referring or copying you, Mr. Michael. The court also commented that the logo Jiaodan used lacked any facial features. So there would be no way that any consumers would identify this product with Michael Jordan, I guess? The Chinese courts boiled the issue down to a simple case of transliteration. Transliteration means using letters of another language to closely approximate the sound and pronunciation of a word. Jiaodan, Jordan, get it? Losing in the courts was a big setback for Michael Jordan, but it wasn't the end of the matter for him. Jordan has always been described as a ceaseless competitor and in litigation, the character attribute remained true. He would continue pursuing legal action and appealing with his lawyers for another eight years. This involved more than 80 lawsuits and countersuits. And finally, in January of 2020, Michael Jordan received favorable news by the Supreme People's Court. The news being that the court had reassessed their prior decision and determined that Zhao Don had likely infringed on Michael Jordan's personality rights. But what we find is that this nearly decade-long legal battle really wasn't even worth it. As in the end, despite the court's ruling with Michael Jordan, he was only granted $54,000 in damages for emotional damages and legal expenses. He was never given any compensation in terms of the sales that the company made. And I think this is a great point to sort of highlight that there's no way to really stop these Jordan bootlegs. Year after year, these bootleg shoes continue to be manufactured at alarming rates and are pretty easy to find if you're looking for them. And those unaware are actively getting scammed on a regular basis. But for the time being, it doesn't look like anything can be done about these. Well, you've made it to the end. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.